All right, well, we deserve a better internet, says investment firm Andreessen Horowitz, one with more resilient, inclusive digital infrastructure, renewed trust in institutions, and an alternative to broken tech paradigms. How do we get there? Clear regulatory frameworks from government leadership. And joining us now to discuss is Tamika Tillman, Global Head of Policy at Andreessen Horowitz. Hello there, Tamika. You know, earlier we spoke about Meta, uh, formerly Facebook, and they also spoke about a, the next internet, a better internet. And I wonder if you, for, there could potentially be a danger of big centralized companies taking over Web 3.0 and controlling all our data again. Well, that is one of the issues that we're trying to address with the policy framework that we have put forward. We see a, a real critical challenge in the form of the Web2 platforms that have consolidated a lot of the internet under their control. Uh, if you look back at the broad history of the evolution of the web, we had the first generation of the internet, which was really based on open protocols and largely decentralized, and then this period of massive centralization that occurred in Web2. We're now seeing a lot of the negative fallout from that period of centralization, and we think it is time to move on to the third generation of the internet, which will be defined by more open protocols, but for the first time as a result of the advances that have been made uh, in digital assets, we have business models that can support community-owned, community-governed platforms in a way that we really weren't able to in the first generation of the internet. That is a huge opportunity to get things right if we get good support from policymakers. So, Micah, so nice to see you on the show. So, you know, Tamika, you're a former speechwriter. You have um, the unique ability to kind of take complex concepts and, and explain them in a simple and accessible way. So I'm going to ask you to do that now. Um, you know, I think one of the issues that I think you and I have talked about before is that there's a challenge in communicating these concepts to policymakers and to you know people in Congress because they're just thinking about really immediate concerns and they're thinking about okay what is going to be an election issue right so how would you take some of these lofty concepts and just give them a sense of urgency right like give them a sense of urgency to people in Congress and say okay this is why we need you know web 3.0 you know this is this is how you would translate this to your constituents this is this could become an election issue like what are some of the ways to frame it in a more urgent like way that people would actually vote on these issues. As we've been discussing these challenges with policymakers in Congress and the Senate and the White House, there are three arguments that really seem to resonate. The first is the fact that the internet as it exists today is neither desirable nor sustainable. Uh, it is not compatible with a healthy open society. Uh, we see that in the form of 100 major data breaches every business day last year. Uh, we see it in the fact that the economic gains of the digital economy are accruing to a handful of individuals who sit on top uh, of the large legacy platforms overwhelmingly. And we see it in the fact that individuals are increasingly increasingly mistrustful of both the platforms and the institutions that rely on the platforms. So we see a, a big opportunity to create a decentralized internet that will give individuals greater control over their digital identity, greater control over their information, greater control over their assets. We see a critical need for open societies in general, and the United States in particular, to develop a system that can compete, a paradigm that will be able to compete effectively with others in the world that are rolling out increasingly sophisticated platforms that are far advanced uh, and really far uh, superior technically uh, to the digital infrastructure that's available in the United States. And we also see an opportunity to decentralize the opportunity that exists around the digital economy, eliminating middlemen, eliminating many of the gatekeepers that control access to participation in the global economy today, and pushing out many of the benefits to those who are currently on the margins uh, of the progress that has occurred in many spaces as a result of innovation in recent years. So Tamika, of course, what, one of the ways in which that's happening is in stable coins, where we're seeing, uh, if you will, a, a, almost a, a a combination of real world versus uh, the, the virtual world. Um, and it, we're, we're expecting some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, comment, uh, report from, from the uh, from, uh, FSOC any day now. How do you think stable coins should be regulated and how do you think they will be regulated? And, and how would you compare the, the two? 
Well, we see three key priorities that should define stablecoin regulation. Uh, and you know, we'll leave it to uh, the FSOC committee to opine on how they're going to do this. And, and we agree we're likely to learn more on that imminently. Um, but uh, the first priority is financial inclusion. We have a system that uh, in the United States leaves millions and millions of people outside of the traditional banking sector, and they're unable for a variety of different reasons uh, to access accounts worldwide. Uh, that number is much, much larger in the billions. Uh, and so we need to be able to design a system that is going to provide more people access uh, to digital financial services. Uh, the second thing we need to be able to do is ensure the integrity of stablecoin issuers and reserves. Uh, it's absolutely appropriate for regulators, in our view, to take an interest uh, in assuring the uh, integrity and solidity of the assets that underpin asset-backed stablecoins. There are, of course, a variety of different stablecoins. Uh, some stablecoins, like USDC, have issued regular attestations by independent accounting firms to ensure uh, that their assets match up with what they uh, are claiming. Uh, we think that's a best practice that should be widely adopted across the ecosystem. Uh, and in our view, there are probably some, some legitimate uh, interests that regulators have in ensuring that stable coins are managed and run uh, correctly. Uh, the final critical task in our view is ensuring the technical resilience of stablecoin networks. These are going to be critical infrastructure for the 21st century. We are going to rely on stable coins and the networks that underpin them to power a lot of the internet's native digital financial architecture. Uh, and for that reason, it's totally legitimate to ensure uh, that the technical systems at the foundation of these platforms uh, are run correctly. Um, we think that if regulators focus on those three areas, and we put out an extensive paper uh, with more details about our views on these issues, uh, we should end up in a decent place. So, Mike, if you just had to sort of pick right now, do you think that the United States needs a central bank digital currency? Yes or no? Obviously, there's a lot of you know caveats in there, but on balance, do you think this is, would be a good thing for the U.S. or not? Well, I think the obvious and immediate opportunity for the United States is doubling down on the very vibrant innovation that's occurring in private stablecoin markets. Uh, we, given the uh, significant lag uh, in U.S. policymakers' uh, focus on these issues, uh, and the fact that many countries are far ahead of the United States uh, in trying to address these challenges, uh, we're not going to be able to catch up anytime soon if we try to pursue a centralized CBDC-based approach. There may in time be plenty of room for a CBDC alongside privately issued stable coins, but we think it's absolutely critical to preserve the dynamism and vitality of a thoughtfully regulated private stable coin market uh, in, in the near term and medium term going forward. Michael, what are some of the consequences if the U U.S. does not address this uh, in a more timely manner? Well, the United States has long enjoyed a role at the as the cornerstone of the global financial system. The, the dollar has been uh, the centerpiece of the global financial system. We are seeing the emergence of a wide array of financial instruments that are technically superior to the dollar. Uh, they are dramatically more sophisticated, they're dramatically more usable in a variety of different applications uh, than the dollar is today. Uh, there is a very real risk for policymakers that if we don't come up uh, with good solutions, uh, be they privately issued dollar-backed and dollar-denominated uh, stablecoins, uh, or potentially uh, a CBDC uh, that is dollar denominated down the road, the United States uh, and the US dollar will lose the position that they've historically enjoyed uh, as a cornerstone of global financial markets. And that'll have some very serious implications, not only for the US economy, uh, but for US leadership and influence in the world. So this is a, a very high stakes issue. Uh, it's good that policymakers are finally paying attention, but it's important for all of us to acknowledge that they're coming late to the game. 